Good day liberators and welcome back to 200 years together by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. But before we continue... Good day liberators! Don't waste your money on thought water! Support me on Subscribestar instead! There are four tiers from which you can choose. Tier 1, hey man, buy me a coffee. Tier 2, heck, buy me two coffees. Tier 3, wow, three coffees, we're getting serious. Or if you really want to take things to the next level and push my caffeine level to over 9000, there's Tier 4, Fur Kaiser, Gott und Vaterland. Whatever tier you decide to choose, your help is greatly appreciated. Thank you kindly for your support. But seriously, if you want, I'll take a dump in a cup for you. With all the nutritious chocolatey taste that goes with it. Chapter 1 continued. The Cajal and Civil Rights The Jews of Poland maintained a vigorous economic relation to the surrounding population. Yet, in the five centuries that they lived there, did not permit any influence from outside themselves. One century after another rolled by in the post-medieval European development, while the Polish Jews remained confined to themselves and became increasingly anachronistic in appearance. They had a fixed order within themselves. Here it is granted that these conditions, which later remained intact also in Russia until the middle of the 19th century, were favorable for the religious and national preservation of the Jews from the very beginning of the diaspora. The whole of Jewish life was guided by the Kahal, which had developed from the communal life of the Jews. The Kahal, plural Kehlot, was the autonomous organization of the leadership of the Jewish congregations in Poland. The Kahal was a buffer between Polish authorities and the Jewish people. It collected taxes, for example. It took care of the needy and also regulated Jewish commerce, approved resales, purchases and leases. It adjudicated disputes between Jews, which could not be appealed to the secular legal system without incurring the ban, or harem. What may have started as a democratic institution took on the qualities of an oligarchy bent on maintaining its own power. In turn, the rabbis and Kahal had a mutually exploitative relationship, in that the rabbis were the executive enforcement arm of the Kahal and owed their position to appointment by the Kahal. Likewise, the Kahal owed the maintenance of its power more to the secular regime than to its own people. Toward end of 17th century and through 18th century, the country was torn by strife. The magnate's arbitrariness increased further. Jews became poor and demoralized and hardened in early medieval forms of life. They became childlike, or better, childish oldsters. 16th century Jewish spiritual rulers were concentrated in Germany and Polish Jewry. They put barriers up against contact with outsiders. The rabbinate held the Jews in firm bondage to the past. The fact that the Jewish people have held themselves together in their diaspora for 2000 years inspires wonder and admiration. But when one examines certain periods more closely, as for example the Polish-Russian one in the 16th and into the middle of the 17th century, and how this unity was only won by means of methods of suppression exercised by the Kehlot, then one no longer knows if it can be evaluated merely as an aspect of religious tradition. If the slightest trace of such isolationism were detected amongst us Russians, we would be severely faulted. When Jewry came under the rule of the Russian state, this indigenous system remained, in which the hierarchy of the Kahal had self-interest. According to J.I. Gesson, all the anger that enlightened Jews felt against the ossifying Talmudic tradition became stronger in the middle of the 19th century. Quote, the representatives of the ruling class of Jewry staked everything on persuading the Russian administration of the necessity to maintain this centuries-old institution which reflected the interests both of the Russian power and of the ruling Jewish class. The Kahal in connection with the rabbis held all the power and not seldom abused it. It misappropriated funds, trampled the rights of the poor, arbitrarily increased taxes and wreaked vengeance on personal enemies." End quote. At the end of the 18th century, the governor of one of the administrative regions attached to Russia wrote in his report, quote, The rabbis, the spiritual council and the Kahal, which are knitted closely together, hold all things in their hand and lord it over the conscience of the Jews. 
and in complete isolation rule over them, without any relation to the civil order." End quote. In 18th century European Jewry, two movements developed, the religious one of the Hasidim or Chassidim, and the enlightening one of favoring secular culture, spearheaded by Moses Mendelssohn, but the Kaelov suppressed both with all its might. In 1781, the rabbinate of Lithuanian Vilna placed a ban over the Hasidim, and in 1784, the Assembly of Rabbis in White Russia, Mogilev, declared them as, quote, outlaws and their property as without owner, end quote. Year after mobs laid waste to the houses of the Hasidim in several cities. In other words, it was an intra-Jewish pogrom. The Hasidim were persecuted in the most cruel and unfair manner. Their rivals did not even feel embarrassed to denounce them before the Russian authorities with false political charges. In turn, in 1799, the officials arrested members of the Kerlot of Vilna for embezzlement of tax money, based on the complaints of Hasidics. The Hasidim movement expanded, being especially successful in certain provinces. The rabbis had Hasidic books publicly burned and the Hasidim emerged as defenders of the people against abusers of the Kerlot. It is apparent that in those times the religious war between Jews overshadowed other questions of religious life. The part of White Russia that fell to Russia in 1772 consisted of the provinces of Polotsk, later Vitebsk, and Mogilev. In a communique to those governments in the name of Catherine, it was explained that their residents, quote, of whichever sex and standing they might be, end quote, would from now on have the right to public exercise of faith and to own property in addition to, quote, all rights, freedoms, and privileges which their subjects previously enjoyed. End quote. The Jews were thus legally set as equals to Christians, which had not been the case in Poland. As to the Jews, it was added that their businesses quote, stay and remain intact with all those rights that they today enjoy. End quote. In other words, nothing would be taken away from Polish rights either. Through this, the previous power of the Kaelot survived. The Jews with their Kahal system remained isolated from the rest of the population and were not immediately taken into the class of traders and businessmen that corresponded to their predominant occupations. In the beginning, Catherine was on her guard not only against the hostile reaction of the Polish nobility, from whom power threatened to slip away, but also given an unfavorable impression to her orthodox subjects. But she did extend wider rights to the Jews, whom she wished well and promised herself to the economic utility to the nation. Already in 1778, the most recent general Russian regulation was extended to White Russia. Those holding up to 500 rubles belonged to the class of trade-plying townsmen. Those with more capital to the class of merchant endowed into one of three guilds according to possession. Both classes were free of the poll tax and paid 1% of their capital which was, quote, declared according to conscience, end quote. This regulation was of particularly great significance. It set aside the national isolation of Jews up to that time. Catherine wanted to end that. Further, she subverted the traditional Polish perspective on Jews as an element standing outside the state. Moreover, she weakened the Kahal system, the capability of the Kahal to compel. The process began of pressing Jews into the civil organism. The Jews availed themselves to a great extent of the right to be registered as merchants, so that, for example, 10% of the Jewish population in the Mogilev province declared themselves as merchants, but only 5.5% of the Christians. The Jewish merchants were now freed from the tax obligation to the Kahal, and did not have to apply to the Kahal anymore for permission to be temporarily absent. They had only to deal with the cognizant magistrate. In 1780, the Jews in Mogilev and Shklov greeted Catherine upon her arrival with odes. With this advance of Jewish merchants, the civil category, Jew, ceased to exist. All other Jews had now likewise to be assigned to a status and obviously the only one left for them was townsmen. But at first, few wanted to be reclassified as such, since the annual poll tax for townsmen at that time was 60 kopecks but only 50 kopecks for Jews. However, there was no other option. From 1783, neither the Jewish townsmen nor merchants needed to pay their taxes to the Kahal, but instead to the magistrate and according to his class, 
and from him they also received their travel passes. The new order had consequences for the cities, which only took status into consideration, not nationality. According to this arrangement, all townsmen and thus all Jews had the right to participate in local class governance and occupy official posts. Corresponding to the conditions of that time, this meant that the Jews became citizens with equal rights. The entry of Jews as citizens with equal rights into the merchant guilds and townsmen's class was an event of great social significance. It was supposed to transform the Jews into an economic power that would have to be reckoned with and raise their morale. It also made the practical protection of their life interest easier. At that time, the classes of traders and tradesmen, just like the municipal commonwealth, had a broad self-determination. Thus, a certain administrative and judicial power was placed into the hands of the Jews just like Christians, through which Jewish population held a commercial and civil influence and significance. Jews could now not only become mayors but also advisory delegates and judges. At first, limitations were enacted in the larger cities to ensure that no more Jews occupied electable positions than Christians. In 1786, however, Catherine sent to the Governor-General of White Russia a command written by her own hand to actualize the equality of Jews, quote, in a municipal class self-governance unconditionally and without any hesitation, end quote, and to, quote, impose an appropriate penalty upon anyone that should hinder this equality, end quote. It should be pointed out that the Jews thus were given equal rights not only in contrast to Poland, but also earlier than in France or the German states. Under Frederick the Great, the Jews suffered great limitations. Indeed, the Jews in Russia had from the beginning the personal freedom that the Russian peasants were only granted 80 years later. Paradoxically, the Jews gained greater freedom than even the Russian merchants and tradesmen. The latter had to live exclusively in the cities, while in contrast the Jewish population could live in colonies in the country and distill liquor. Although the Jews dwelled in clusters not only in the city but also in villages, they were accounted as part of the city contingent inclusive of merchant and townsman classes. According to the manner of their activity and surrounded by unfree peasantry, they played an important economic role. Rural trade was concentrated in their hands, and they leased various posts belonging to the landowner's privilege, specifically the sale of vodka in taverns, and there were fostered the expansion of drunkenness. The White Russian powers reported, quote, The presence of Jews in the villages acts with harm upon the economic and moral condition of the rural population, because the Jews encourage drunkenness among the local population, end quote. In the stance taken by the powers that be, it was indicated among other things that the Jews led the peasants astray with drunkenness, idleness and poverty, that they had given them vodka on credit, received pledges in pawn for vodka, etc., but the brandy operations were an attractive source of income for both the Polish landowners and Jewish commissioners. Granted, the gift of citizenship that the Jews received brought a danger with it. Obviously, the Jews were supposed to acquiesce the general rule to seize the brandy business in the villages and move out. In 1783, the following decree was published. Quote, the general rule requires every citizen to apply himself in a respectable trade and business but not the distilling of schnapps as that is not a fitting business, end quote. And whenever the proprietor, quote, permits the merchant, townsman or Jew to distill vodka, he will be held as a lawbreaker, end quote. And thus it happened. They began to transfer the Jews from the villages to the cities to deflect them from their centuries-old occupation, the leasing of distilleries and taverns, end quote. To the Jews, the threat of complete removal from the villages naturally appeared not only as a uniform civil measure, but rather as one that was set up specifically to oppose their national religion. The Jewish townsmen that were supposed to be resettled into the city and unambiguously were to be robbed of a very lucrative business in the country fell into an inner city and inner Jewish competition. Indignation grew among the Jews and in 1784 a commission of the Kerala travelled to St. Petersburg to seek the cancellation of these measures. At the same time, the Kerala reasoned that they should, with the help of the administration, regain their lost power in its full extent over the Jewish population. But the answer of the Tsarina read, quote, As soon as the people yoked to the Jewish law have arrived at the condition of equality, the order must be upheld in every case, 
so that each according to his rank and status enjoys the benefit and rights without distinction of belief and national origin." End quote. But the clenched power of the Polish proprietors also had to be reckoned with. Although the administration of White Russia forbade them in 1783 to lease the schnapps distilling to unauthorized persons, especially Jews, the landlords continued to lease this industry to Jews. That was their right, an inheritance of centuries-old Polish custom. The Senate did not venture to apply force against the landholders and in 1786 removed their jurisdiction to relocate Jews into the cities. For this a compromise was found. The Jews would be regarded as people that had relocated to the cities but would retain the right to temporary visits to the villages. That meant that those that were living in the villages continued to live there. The Senate permission of 1786 permitted the Jews to live in villages and Jews were allowed to lease from the landholders the right to produce and sell alcohol beverages, while Christian merchants and townsmen did not obtain these rights. Even the efforts of the delegation of Kehlot in St. Petersburg was not wholly without success. They did not get what they came for, the establishment of a separate Jewish court for all contentions between Jews. But in 1786, a significant part of their supervisory right was given back, the supervision of Jewish townsmen, in other words, the majority of the Jewish population. This included not only the division of public benefits, but also the levying of poll tax and adjudicating the right to separate from the congregation. Thus, the administration recognized its interest in not weakening the power of the Kahal. In all Russia, the status of traders and businessmen, merchants and townsmen, did not have the right to choose their residences. Their members were bound to that locality in which they were registered, in order that the financial position of their localities would not be weakened. However, the Senate made an exception in 1782 for White Russia. The merchants could move, quote, as the case might be, as it was propitious for commerce, end quote, from one city to another. The ruling favored especially the Jewish merchants. However, they began to exploit this right in a greater extent than had been foreseen. Jewish merchants began to be registered in Moscow and Smolensk. Jews began soon after the annexation of White Russia in 1782 to settle in Moscow. By the end of the 18th century, the number of Jews in Moscow was considerable. Some Jews that had entered the ranks of the Moscow merchant class began to practice wholesaling. Other Jews, in contrast, sold foreign goods from their apartments or in courts, or began peddling, though this was at the time forbidden. In 1790, the Moscow merchants submitted a complaint to the government. Quote, in Moscow has emerged a not insignificant number of Jews from foreign countries, and from White Russia who has opportunity afforded joined the Moscow merchant guilds and then utilized forbidden methods of business, which brought about very hurtful damage, and the cheapness of their goods indicates that it involves smuggling, but moreover as it is well known they cut coins. It is possible that they will also do this in Moscow." End quote. As a response to their thoroughly cagey findings, the Moscow merchants demanded their removal from Moscow. The Jewish merchants appealed with a counter-complaint that they were not accepted into the Smolensk and Moscow merchant guilds. The Council of Her Majesty heard the complaints. In accordance with the Unified Russian Order, she firmly established that the Jews did not have the right to be registered in the Russian trading towns and harbors, but only in White Russia. Quote, by no means is usefulness to be expected, end quote, from the migration of Jews into Moscow. In December 1791, she promulgated a highest order ukase, which prohibited Jews from joining the merchant guilds of the inner provinces, but permitted them for a limited time for trade reasons to enter Moscow. Jews were allowed to utilize the right of the merchant guilds and townsmen class only in White Russia. The right to permanent residency and membership in the townsmen class, Catherine continued, was granted in New Russia, now accessible in the Vesar Agencies of Yakaterinoslav, Quote, glory of Catherine the Great, end quote, later changed to the Dnipropetrovsk and Taurida. That is, Catherine allowed Jews to migrate into the new expansive territories, in which Christian merchants and townsmen from the provinces of interior Russia generally were not permitted to immigrate. When in 1796 it was made known that groups of Jews had already immigrated into the Kiev, Chernigov, and Novgorod Siversk provinces, it was likewise granted there to utilize the right of the merchant guild and the townsman class. The pre-revolution Jewish encyclopedia writes, quote, 
The UK's of 1791 laid the groundwork for setting up the Pale of Settlement, end quote, even if it wasn't so intended. Under the conditions of the then obtaining social and civic order in general, and of Jewish life in particular, the administration could not consider bringing about a particularly onerous situation and conclude for them exceptional laws, which among other things would restrict the right of residency. In the context of its time, the UKs did not contain that which in this respect would have brought the Jews into a less favourable condition than the Christians. The UKs in 1791 in no way limited the rights of Jews in the choice of residency, created no special borders, and for Jews the way was opened into new regions, into which general people could not immigrate. The main point of the decree was not concerned with their Jewishness, but that they were traitors. The question was not considered from the national or religious point of view, but only from the viewpoint of usefulness. This UK of 1791, which actually granted privileges to Jewish merchants in comparison to Christian ones, was in course of time the basis of the future Pale of Settlement, which almost until the revolution cast as it were a dark shadow over Russia. By itself, however, the UK of 1791 was not so oppressive as to prevent a small Jewish colony from emerging in St. Petersburg by the end of the reign of Catherine II. Here lived the famous tax leaser Abraham Peretz and some of the merchants close to him. And also, while the religious struggle was in full swing, the rabbi Evigdor Chaimovich and his opponent, the famous Hasidic Tzadik Zalman Boruchevich. In 1793 and 1795, the second and third partition of Poland took place, and the Jewish population from Lithuania, Moldolia, and Volhynia, numbering almost a million, came under Russia's jurisdiction. This increase in population was a very significant event, though for a long time not recognized as such. It later influenced the fate of both Russia and the Jewry of East Europe. After centuries-long wandering, Jewry came under one roof, in a single great congregation. In the now vastly expanded region of Jewish settlement, the same questions came up as before. The Jews obtained rights of merchant guilds and townsmen, which they had not possessed in Poland, and they got the right to equal participation in the class municipal self-government. Then had to accept the restrictions of their status, they could not migrate into the cities of the inner Russian provinces, and were liable to be moved out of the villages. With the now huge extent of the Jewish population, the Russian regime no longer had a way to veil the fact that the Jews continued to live in the villages simply by modeling it as a temporary visit. A burning question was whether the economic condition would tolerate so many tradesmen and traders living amongst the peasants. In order to defuse the problem, many shetetl were made equal to cities. Thus, the legal possibility came about for Jews to continue living there. But with the large numbers of Jews in the country and the high population density in the cities, that was no solution. It seemed to be a natural way out that the Jews would take advantage of the possibility offered by Catherine to settle in the huge, scarcely occupied New Russia. The new settlers were offered inducements, but this did not succeed in setting a colonization movement into motion. Even the freedom of the new settlers from taxes appeared not to be attractive enough to induce such a migration. Thus Catherine decided in 1794 to induce the Jews to emigrate with contrary measures. The Jews were relocated out of the villages. At the same time, she decided to assess the entire Jewish population with a tax that was double that paid by the Christians. Such a tax had already been paid for a long time by the old believers, but applied to the Jews. This law proved to be neither effective nor of long duration. Those were the last regulations of Catherine. From the end of 1796, Paul I reigned. The Jewish Encyclopedia evaluates him in this way, quote, The time of the angry rule of Paul I passed well for the Jews. All edicts of Paul I concerning the Jews indicate that the monarch was tolerant and benevolent toward the Jewish population, end quote. When the interests of Jews conflicted with Christians, Paul I by no means automatically sided with the Christian. Even when in 1797 he ordered measures to reduce the power of the Jews and the spirituals over the peasants, that was actually directed against the Jews. The point was the protection of the peasants. Paul recognized also the right of the Hasidim not to have to live in secrecy. 
He extended the rights of Jews to belong to the merchant and townsman class even to the Courland province, which was no Polish inheritance. And later, it also did not belong to the Pale of Settlement. Consistent with that policy, he denied the respective petitions of the parishes of Kovno, Kamenes Podolsk, Kiev and Vilna to be permitted to move the Jews out of the cities. Paul had inherited the stubborn resistance of the Polish landholders against changing of their rights. Amongst these was the right over the Jews and the right to hold court over them. They misused these rights often. Thus the complaint of the Jews of Berdychev or Ukraine against the princes of Radzivil stated, quote, We must first pay gold to those to whom the prince has leased our faith, end quote. And against Catherine's former favorite Simon Zorich, quote, one ought not to have to pay him for the air one breathes, end quote. In Poland, many Chetetlian cities were the possession of nobles, and the landowners assessed arbitrary and opportunistic levies that the residents had to pay. 